This episode of our podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage for your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1 855 385 4226 or visit their website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another edition of our podcast. We have so much news tonight and some late-breaking news as it specifies to the Canadian government regarding our federal EV rebate, but we'll cover that a little bit later in the show. I want to bring on my usual cadre of guests, Mr. Ian Pavelko and Eric Camacho. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Wow. I don't know what the weather's been like, but it's a beautiful sunny day today, and I had a chance to get out and do some stuff, which is great. But tonight is more important because we have to do the podcast. Tomorrow I am leaving for Montreal, and uh, Ian and I will do some hanging out at one point because it is Easter weekend coming up. Yeah, man. So uh, our bags are packed, the cat is over at the cat sitter, and we're ready to rock and roll. But we have a lot of Tesla news to get into, so we're just going to kind of dive right in because we have a couple of things that we want to spend some time on tonight. So um, a lot of this stuff is going to be um, uh, taking off to Twitter because Elon got into Twitter and had one of his famous tweet storms again. So the first one I want to bring up here is Elon has confirmed that right-hand drive Model 3 available um, in a few weeks. Deliveries are to start in June and July. Here's the actual tweet. Sean Murphy uh, had asked Elon, come on, Elon, give us some UK customers some news. So he took to Twitter and said left-hand drive. Actually, he meant right-hand drive because he corrected himself in a tweet right afterwards. Um, The order page should be live within a few weeks. Deliveries to start hopefully in June or July. So that is uh, some great news for those waiting on the right-hand drive countries. Um, No talk about Australia at this point, although I believe that uh, once those cars get in production, they'll be able to send them to uh, both respective um, areas there to Asia Pacific, of course, and the UK. There's a lot of pent-up demand for those cars. So all good news on that front. Um, The next little tidbit information comes from uh, Twitter as well. The Model 3, and and Elon was just confirming because somebody had asked on Twitter here. Actually, it was Galileo Russell himself, Mr. Hyperchange himself. Um, He basically asked Elon, the uh, average, well, he got talking about Uber and so on and so forth and uh, talking about transportation costs. And Elon jumped on and said the Model 3 drive unit and body is designed like a commercial truck for a million mile life. Uh, We had seen some pictures, I think, from Tesla uh, two or three months ago anyways, where they'd taken apart one of the drivetrains on the Model 3 and showed that it basically had no wear and tear on it. So anyways... Elon said the current battery module should last 300 to 500,000 miles, which is about 1,500 charge cycles. Replacing the modules, not the pack, uh, will only cost five to $7,000. Now, there has been a lot of discussion, of course, on cost of Model 3 battery packs, what the cost of replacement is. I'm projecting at this point, I'm going to think that Elon is talking about future value, not necessarily today. So uh, just so you do some math, the Model 3 has four battery modules in it. The S and X have 16. So kind of do some math as far as that's concerned. So it looks like the modules can be replaced individually rather than um, not necessarily the whole pack. So it just, I think in some ways it represents some efficiencies on their part. So it's all good. Um, you know, we talked about this on the last podcast last week. You know, somebody had asked, mm-hmm. you know, how long does it last? And we said, well, 20 years. Well, again, it kind of falls in. Maybe this is a little bit of follow-up from last week that uh, there's your answer. Uh, basically, don't worry about it. <laughs> Okay, moving along. Um, Sources. This is an article from uh, Electric, which comes up. Uh, If I can just bring it up here. uh, They're saying that Tesla is planning a bigger S and S refresh uh, than we had originally thought. So basically the article goes and talks about um, the supposed information that they'd received last uh, year about the interior refresh on the S and the X. Um, It is largely overdue. And we had talked about this on the podcast last week, or it might have been the week before, where somebody had asked about, you know, know, when is the S and the X going to get some kind of battery tech update? Because, let's face it, compared to the Model 3, especially with V3 supercharging now here, 
um, it's looking a little rough on those cars because they're supposed to be the premium cars after a, you know after the fact. And I had a conversation last week with uh, with Sean Mitchell, who runs a great YouTube channel called All Things EV, and he asked me the same question. We had this discussion, and here we are. This is tangible, possible tangible evidence that we are going to see a refresh. We had talked about this. Remember last week, Eric, um, that. Production numbers, of course, had come out at the time um, on mm -hmm. Tesla and deliveries, and they were significantly lower on the S and the X. So if this is actually true, I think it's kind of an indication that they're slowing down perhaps production on those cars in preparation for a refresh because the last thing you want, of course, is a lot of inventory sitting on hand for these cars. So I hope it happens. I know a lot of people personally that have been asking me, when's it going to happen? Because I'm at the end of the lease. I want to buy a new car. What should I do? And I'm like, mm -hmm. man, I don't know. If you can wait a little bit, the rumor's going around that we're going to see an update. So I think it's high time. Yeah. I'm um, looking forward to that. Um, yeah. I, I, think I still the, love my car. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say the big news in that one is apparently uh, the rumor is they are going to switch it to the 2170 cells. That was the one that kind of blew me away because Elon has denied that publicly many times. But I mean, you know, we've all sort of scratched our heads over that. It's like, really? You're going to like redesign the car. Here's your chance to, to incorporate a new pack and you don't want to use your new hot cell, you know, that you know, it's got all these great efficiencies and can handle, you know, the greater supercharging rates. It didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So I got to think that's true. Well, part of me believes that Elon was pur pur purposely deflecting those questions. He's been saying all the time, we have no plans. We have no plans. Not, we have no plans. And this is a conversation I had with Sean because he asked me the same question, too. What about, you know, what Elon had said that we don't have any plans? The thing you have to remember is that if Elon says no comment, that is al mm. you're almost tacitly yes. saying, yes, we have something. Yeah. I think he's right in the sense that he should deflect the question. He should just outright like, say, we have no plans because he can go back and later on say, yeah, we changed our mind. Here we go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the last thing you want to do is Osborne your cars. I mean, these are supposed to be, you know, high margin cars. So if you come out and say, yeah, we have plans and we're going to update them and, you know, we'll talk about that in the future, man, you just killed all your sales. Yeah. Especially in a critical uh, in a critical point where your Model 3 is almost profitable and you need those funds to be coming in. So I don't blame them for deflecting. If this happens, I've long said that it doesn't make any sense for them to continue with 18650 on those cars long term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At some point, they have to update the tech because... They need it to support V3. I think it's it's all part and parcel to uh, the battery techno technology. Um, do I think that the car warrants a complete redesign? Not necessarily. I think mm -hmm. there's, I mean, I'm not an engineer, but, you know, the cell isn't that much bigger. They could redesign the battery pack physically um, within, the, the, within the, the physical constraints that they have on the vehicle to actually adapt these cells. Um, and... I don't know. We'll see. But um, I think maybe the Model S might need to. Oh, the other thing, too, of course, that the report was saying, too, is that uh, uh, there is a distinct possibility they may go to a CCS port, much like they did on the Model 3. That would require some changes in the taillights. And I do remember there was a scuttlebutt going around last year that the refresh of the cars would involve taillights. I do remember that distinctly. So... Tie that in, kind of indicates that uh, there's some changes coming for the charge ports. And again, for North America, and a lot of people have been asked, uh, you know, um, are they going to be changing the charge ports for North America? And, and I said, well, they don't necessarily need to, but they could do the same thing they did for Europe and go around, retrofit all the stations, give you two cables, off you go. Bob's your uncle. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've beaten this one to death. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, this is the big one. Um, so Tesla put out a, let me just bring it up here. A blog post, an update on our vehicle lineup, because the standard range Model 3 is essentially off menu. Um, Tesla is saying that um, basically the standard uh, plus um, is now 39.5 because it includes autopilot. So autopilot used to be $3,000 on its own. They're discounting it a thousand bucks. It's included in the car. It's not free. You have to pay for it. It's included in the cost of the car, but there is a $2,000 increase. And they said that the standard range Model 3 is now a software limited battery pack. I know that was a question that had come up in the podcast before. And we said, well, we didn't really know. But essentially, that's what they're doing. So largely what's happening here is that uh, I think the take rate on the standard range Model 3 hasn't been as much as they expected. The take rate on the uh, standard plus has been better. 
So it's gone off menu, which means you either have to call a showroom or you have to call Tesla directly to order the car. It is going to be essentially a standard plus that's going to be uh, software limited. You'll still get the better interior. And my understanding, I um, haven't 100% confirmed it, but autopilot is still off off menu. You still have to buy it separately. So they're going to try and maintain that $35,000 price, but it's not looking too good. Um, historically, there have been times when Tesla puts something off menu that that's essentially that's where things go to die. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, you can still get the car. I would recommend if you want one, order one as soon as possible because, you know, what's the old saying? Would Tesla give us? Tesla can take, take it away. Exactly. So, yes, standard $35,000 Model 3, we hardly knew ye. So, <laughs> <laughs> good show title, I think, maybe. Any thoughts on this, guys? I uh, I'm intrigued. I was not aware of the fact that uh, you are getting this, the the plus interior on this, uh, and it makes sense, I guess, for the few number of cars they're going to make. Why the hell are they going to mess around with you know a different interior? So that's that's kind of interesting. That's about my only takeaway from that. Other other than that, um, I noticed on that same uh, we've got that on the same title there that the leasing is now available. Did you want to talk about that as a separate item? Because I don't think we yeah. Because there is a question that came up a little bit later, and we'll answer that maybe in the viewer questions. So yes, sure. the well yeah. So the Model Three is now available, um, and this is critical too because we're going to get in some autopilot stuff because this ties into it as well. So customers in the U.S. now can actually get a lease on a Model Three, and the uh, mileage, the yearly mileage, a lot are uh, 10,000, 12,000, or 15,000 miles. I, I, I agree with Ryan McCaffrey on his latest podcast to make a recommendation that um, if you think you, you can, you're only going to drive 10,000 miles, maybe you want to bump it up a little bit because when you get these cars, you're going to want to drive a lot. Now, the last thing you want to do is go over your mileage on the lease because it will cost you. I've been through that before, made a mistake one time, went over my lease, and it cost the fortune to get out. 25 of cents per mile in the U.S. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So be very careful about that. If you think you're going to drive a little bit, but might be marginal, uh, bump it up once or twice because, uh, yeah, you're going to drive the heck out of this car. They're a lot of fun. Interestingly enough, too, they also state that customers who choose leasing over owning will not have the option to purchase their car at the end of the lease because with full autonomy coming in the future via an over-the-air software update, we plan to use those vehicles in the Tesla ride-hailing network. Ooh, there is a vote of confidence there that they are going to get this stuff organized. I mean, if they're saying, what are the lease rates at this? Um, they, they offer a minimum two year. I think they are advertising three year, but I think you can get a two year. So let's say two to three years. That's a big vote of confidence for FSD, I think. I mean, Elon's been making a lot of noise. We'll talk about that here uh, very shortly in another article that we've got talking about. And of course, the investor autonomy day is coming up next week. So um, maybe they maybe they're a little further ahead than they're letting on. They've been awfully quiet about it, although you know Elon has been talking about it more and more publicly. So there you go. You can't buy the car at the end of the lease. You got you have no choice. You got to turn this puppy in. So if you want to buy the car, maybe there's some other third party opportunities for third party leasing. It is possible to do that for those of you who want that. So anything else we need to cover in here? Um, yeah, I think we basically covered it. Yeah, the, uh, by the way, the uh, standard um, the standard range car is limited by 10% in terms of range. So, again, there's that software lock on the car. You can unlock it in the future, though. So it is something that um, they haven't disclosed the pricing on that. So if you want to buy a standard range Model 3 and you want to turn it into a standard plus, well, there you go. Software unlock is back, baby. Okay, um, next little one here. I, I is love this one. Yeah. <laughs> This article comes uh, courtesy of Tesla Roddy. Tesla Sentry Mode captures a politician <laughs> in a Model 3 hit and run. <laughs> oh my gosh. So a, Fid a Philadelphia council, uh, council member was caught uh, hitting a Tesla Model 3. Uh, he was pulling out of his parking space. He had a Cadillac Escalade. And uh, in the video, and I'll, I'll link to it in the uh, show description, in the podcast description, you guys can uh, read and watch this video. But he knows he did a boo-boo here because he gets out and he's looking, he's inspecting the car and he's trying to rub out the buff marks and so on and so forth. So anyways, it does not look good for this purpose, uh, for this person. Um, yeah, Tesla, you know, I mean, uh, combined with the person that was caught last week um, in California, breaking the window, of course, sentry mode is actually working. Now, again, it won't prevent from people from hitting your car and stuff, but now at least you have some evidence 
But um, you, you skipped the best part of the story, Trev, is the guy wasn't just running for, for counsel, which he was currently. He's a former traffic court judge. <laughs> this guy was a judge. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> oh, man. That's the part I love. <laughs> Like your justice system at work. Po- yeah, and Elon tweeted, poetic justice. Exactly. It's perfect. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, we, often, we often wonder what people who are considered higher than thou and noble, what they do when the cameras are off and no one's around. Well, we, we now have an idea. The question has mm-hmm. been answered. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So, yes, don't fool around with, uh, with sentry mode because uh, you never know who's watching. Okay. Um, I'll, yep. I want to hop back on Twitter here because um, a lot of this stuff is coming up because people are asking um, Elon some questions and stuff. So this one comes back. Um, Brandon Bern- uh, Bernicki, uh, I hope I pronounced that right with my reading glasses here, hopped on Twitter and he was asking about an enhanced summon situation because enhanced summon has been delayed a little bit. Um, so Elon said that um, uh Enhanced Summon was supposed to roll out last week, but he says it's not good in yet. They're pushing for a release in a few weeks. He says it will be amazing. Now, if you've hunted around a little bit on the internet, there are some videos of Enhanced Summon. Kim from the Like Tesla channel did one where they had a friend of theirs who was in the early access program. Uh, did a very interesting video. They were able to pull the car out in a relatively empty parking lot, and then later on when the parking lot was a little bit more full with people. So... Um, how much they're going to improve it? I hope it it gets really good. But so far, from what I'm from what I've seen personally, it's it's looking really impressive. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's see here. Moving along here. Right, this is the one that I wanted to show everybody here. Here's another another one here. We're going back to Twitter, folks. I know we're jumping around here a little bit. Um, someone named Sanjeev on Twitter had asked Elon and says, in addition to recognizing traffic lights with FSD, we'll be able to recognize and take e-pass lanes on exit. And he said, yes. So for those of you who have um, the e-pass for the transponders and stuff, um, that bodes well. Again, this is a U.S. thing. I'm hoping in Canada we get you know roughly the same idea as well. So lots of improvements that are certainly coming. Again, no timelines given. Um, but Tesla is, is certainly paying attention to a lot of this stuff. Again, you know, with FSD, it's a vision-based system. So if they can train the system and then build the logic around it, I don't think there's any limitations of what's actually possible with these cars. Okay, last one here we want to get into before we move on to some other stuff. Um, you guys have seen this. Um, again, it ties into FSD and the autopilot situation here. This interview by uh, Lex Fridman on uh, YouTube uh, with Elon. And they do a huge deep dive. Uh, he's asking some really, really good questions about FSD and what the, pl- um, what the plans are. And my takeaway from this at the end um, of the article, and I'll put a link again in the video in the podcast description. You guys can actually watch this video if you haven't seen it. But um, Elon is really confident in this thing, that they're going to pull this thing off. Um, I want your takes on this, guys. Um, Ian, you've watched it. I watched it twice, as a matter of fact. I was mm-hmm. fascinated by it. I'd heard Lex Fridman's name, and I knew he was like one of the brains behind the MIT study and, you know, deep into a lot of their autonomous projects. I wasn't aware, however, that that's all the same group that built uh, Black Betty, that uh, I think it's a Lincoln that they have that's autonomous. Uh, yes. And I watched a few of the videos on that. This guy is amazing, like a uh, very um, multi talented individual, um, asks excellent questions. He, st- he reminds me a lot of Elon. I guarantee you they're both like in the MBTI scale. They both have to be super rational. So, like, you know, <laughs> it was like watching two androids almost kind of, you know, talk in an interview, but like super interesting conversation. And uh, yeah, my general takeaway is the same as yours. Like he's every interview, he's more and more confident. After Ark Invest, I thought, wow, you know, he's like super, super sure that this is going somewhere by next year, like the full enchilada. And he just he just double downed on it in this interview. Um, and what was interesting is Alex's whole thing is he he along with Alex Roy and quite a few other people who are very you know. Um, very, very aware of uh, autonomy's capabilities and so on, and autonomous and technologies. Yeah, exactly. And vocal are all big on the idea that you have to monitor driver behavior. You know, they want cameras in the cars looking at the driver. They make a big deal out of that. And Elon was like flat out, no. Like in six months, that'll be completely irrelevant. Like we'll be so safe that you know the driver can be doing handstands in the back seat kind of thing. He didn't say that. I'm putting words in his mouth, but he's effectively, it. he's saying that yeah. Uh, We'll be so safe that actually the idea that we have to even worry about the driver being there is, you know, or any driver intervention would be possibly a negative at the level of safety that we anticipate we're going to achieve by next year. So 
that was pretty powerful. The only other thing that I wanted to say on that interview that I found a little bit scary is in all of the other previous times he's talked about autopilot since it was launched, his whole pitch, I think maybe to suck in people like me, was don't worry, we're not taking your steering wheel away. Autopilot when you want it and you can enjoy driving your car when you don't. And he came flat out and said in this interview that, you know, Sometime in the future, decades from now, we're going to look back and the idea that, you know, humans were allowed to drive these two-ton death machines will horrify us. And I was like, bro, don't tell me you're trying to take me out of the equation now because this is not <laughs> yeah, going to yeah, end yeah. well. <laughs> you know, from my cold dead hands, to, to, to borrow an expression, are you taking my steering wheel? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was not keen on that state. I know what he means, but it's like that's a little bit kind of… Um, this, too soon. Yeah, too soon. Too soon to be too talking soon. about this. Yeah. You know, my, my whole thing about a t- about autopilot, and I think what Tesla needs to spend some more time on is frame it in the context of, um, of, of safety. Um, I had this conversation with my dad the other day. Um, he's back from Florida. And um, I was just talking to him about, you know, autonomy and what's going on and the fact that I had bought FSD and stuff. And I told him, look, it may all sound all George Jetson, and yes, there's a lot of talk about it, but in the end of the, at the end of the day, the whole purpose of it is safety. I'm looking at FSD and autopilot in, in the context of it becoming very much like seat belts, airbags, um, automatic emergency braking, anti-lock brakes. These are all safety features that will just be built into every car. Every car is going to have this stuff because it's considered a safety feature. That's the way I'm looking at it from that aspect. Everything else after that is just gravy. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, that's probably right. Eric, you watched it? I did. Um, it, it, it was a very insightful interview. Um, so I think some things we hadn't heard before uh, from Elon, so that was kind of cool. But I think, you know, in sort of echoing your sentiments, I the belief I have is it's good for us to be forward thinking this way, to look at the way we drive vehicles now and how we can sort of change that in the future. Uh, the thing for me was really the, the first prevailing thought that I had was how it is for drivers here where I live in Florida, where just even coming home from work today, there were several different accidents I saw on several different roadways, both local streets and on the highway. And my immediate thought was if those vehicles were to be fully autonomous, where we don't have to even be behind the steering wheel, what, what's, ideally, can the computer outsmart a person, and can it be more responsive to avoid an accident? Will it know how to swerve out of a lane? Will it know how to do all these different things that humans can sort of do because we have a, a, a hand response time? So, it, the idea is that we're even if we have our cars at level four, level five autonomy in the next couple of years, if not longer, there's still going to be how many cars in the road that are not, mm-hmm. and there's still human drivers behind those. So, I, what I love about this, and we talked about it in the numbers last week with the safety report for autopilot, is that Tesla is doing its part to show you. Um, without question, that their vehicles are the safest cars on the road, both in terms of accident prevention and in terms of construction, that you're you're safer in our cars than any other car. But it also means that because of the accident rate of every other car, the chance of a Tesla at some point having an accident um, because the computer just couldn't react in time or it, you know, just, it was just unavoidable because of the other driver being human in a regular gas car or whatever it is. Um, it's going to happen. So I, it's, it's, I'm glad that we're trying to get to the point of thinking decades from now, imagine if everything was driverless, if there were no cars where humans were at control because computers can have to the millisecond of a response time, can f- calculate things within fractions of a distance. Um, that'd be great. Um, but, <laughs> but I think people like Ian who love driving cars would go, over my dead body. Not that's not going to happen in my <laughs> lifetime. Um, yeah, I, I love driving my car, but I also know that you know autopilot has its benefits. Um, but we're 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 getting there. Uh, it's just a matter of you know, it's it's going to happen. But you know we'll, we'll see if we can make it as you know it's ideally it's the other drivers outside of our cars. Then I'm worried about what's inside of it. I yeah just just to put one last thing on that I think Alex Roy has the best vision of it I'd ever seen and he wrote this article I think last year 
where it was um, this imaginary uh, write-up, a review of what is it, the 2032 Porsche 911, which was either a hybrid or a fully electric drivetrain. And you could completely drive it, but it had basically like this accident prevention system. So it was sort of a hybrid of human driving and an autopilot. So you basically, you had like a zone around the car where you could drive. So you could drive the car to its limit on a beautiful windy road. But the minute you got to a point where you're either potentially going to go into the oncoming lane or not see an obstacle or go off the road or lose control, the car takes over and corrects for you. So it, it gives you the sense that you're actually, what well, you are driving the car, but it's impossible to crash. Like he'd sort of use this term, like the car is now crash proof or something. That mm -hmm. to me is a future I can embrace. Like if I choose to drive the car, it's not going to let me do anything that would potentially endanger myself or anyone else on the road. But I still, within the parameters of it being safe, can drive the car myself. That, that I think would be a cool outcome. Yeah, I think long term, though, who knows what's going to happen? Um, yeah. I, you know, there's edge cases for everything. And, there, I mean, even with autopilot being as safe as it is, it, it's going to encounter issues where, you know, it's just inevitable. There will be some kind of accident or, or, God forbid, some kind of death or something. I am certainly not looking forward to the headlines. I mean, we get enough bad headlines as it is right now. Mm -hmm. Tesla sneezes and we get bad headlines. Imagine when FSD comes on and the first death occurs. Oh, we're just not going to hear the end of that. It's no. just going to be bad. <laughs> but, but again, well, you, 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 sorry, go ahead, Eric. No, I was going to say, I mean, look, the, the, the truth of the matter is we're always hearing about product recalls and all sorts of issues. And Fisher Price has an issue now because they've got infants essentially falling out of these little rockers. and stuff. I mean, the, the, we're always going to have that. Consumer Reports puts out stuff. I mean, we're always mm. going to hear something about some recall, some issue. What... What troubles me is how glorified it is simply because it's Tesla's name. But I think the same thing applies to Google or Apple or Amazon or any major conglomerate or some company that's just always in the headlines. Any any kind of negative blemish that comes out is is just ballooned into this huge you know, stratosphere that it doesn't belong in. And I think when it comes to full self-driving, if there is a death in the car, which – Again, depending on the circumstances, uh, we have to investigate. But even now, when there's an accident where there's a death, a fire, or something involving a Tesla, the immediate response from people goes, "See, look, they're they're death machines. They're terrible. Yeah. They're you know they're bombs waiting to go off or whatever." And it's when you fall into that negative trap time and again, then the rhetoric just continues. Ideally, it's a matter of saying, "Okay, let's let's hold on a second. Let's investigate this. Let the Police and other local yeah. authorities do their report. Let Tesla investigate the report of the accident. You know, once all the stuff is, is factored in, which, again, is asking for a lot for some people. But once the numbers come out and they go, well, here's what happened. Here's A, B, and C. Here are the events that materialized in the order that they happened and, and that sort of thing. And then maybe we'll go, okay, so this was just a fluke coincidence or was the other driver's fault or whatever it is. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's – we're, we're advancing, technology is driving us where we're going nowadays. We're seeing more and more things, sort of robots in places and hotels and what have you. Um, you know, Amazon drones. Like, we're, we're, at a, we're at a point where technology is an unavoidable consequence of industrial uh, progress. So to all of a sudden curb that and go, well, hold on now. Let's, let's not take the human out of everything. I agree with you. But to say that we're just going to stop all progress because you're worried about one or two things happening, well, that's, you can't. You can't be that cautious all the time. So we'll, we'll see where it goes. Well, um, I will say that all of this talk and all this movement that's happening makes me very happy and proud that I actually own a yeah. Tesla. I know I have the safest car, the most technologically advanced car, and for a tech guy, that spins my little beanie propeller. So <laughs> I'm very happy about that. All right, let's move on. A little bit more information about FSD just came out. Of course, uh, Elon took to Twitter to answer somebody's response. Ryan Grove had asked about Tesla's full self-driving option. Does it make more sense as a subscription service um, than an expensive one-time purchase? Blah, blah, blah. So Elon basically said, yeah, there will be a subscription service. The economics at this point uh, favor the initial purchase. So for those of you who are asking whether you'll be able to get uh, full FSD or FSD as we know it today as a subscription service, that will happen. I would believe that the timing of that could coincide at the same time as the ride hailing network or shortly thereafter where people will be able to buy those cars fully equipped with that and then get in some kind of subscription service. I expect to be able to get more color on that maybe next week at the investor um, 
the autonomy investor uh, demonstration that they do. So they're supposed to flesh that out. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, let's see here. Speaking of FSD, Elon again hopping on Twitter to answer someone else's question about the availability of the FSD computer upgrade. Uh, when will the Hardware 3 computer, also known as FSD, be available for Model 3 owners who have already purchased FSD? Elon responded with Tesla. We'll start the FSD computer upgrade in a few months. No indication as to what a few months means. Could be anywhere from two to probably six. So those of you who are asking, there you go. Uh, one more tweet here before we move on to some other stuff. Well, maybe a couple more. <laughs> so many tweets this week. Um, tweet, tweet. Tweet, tweet. Yes. Uh, I hope I got this person's name correctly. Kaylin Roman ha uh, had asked, if I pay today uh, the deposit for Model Y, will my price stay the same if I order with the FSD? Thanks. Elon took to Twitter and said, yes. So you are price protected if you buy a car now. Um, who knows? Maybe Tesla might be more in a better financial position to actually offer the standard range Model Y when they get around to it. I would hate for them to, you know, uh, off menu that car when the time comes. So, um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. One more article from Tesla Roddy, our good friends at Tesla Roddy, talking about Gigafactory 3. This is another conversation I just had with my dad yesterday because, um, of course, he's not following Tesla like we do, but he does ask questions. And, um, I sent him a couple pictures uh, of the uh, land that Tesla had bought and initially had plowed it. I guess it was back in, well, they started flattening the land. I think it was in about October of last year. And, of course, in January, they had their little ceremony. So, anyways, Tesla Roddy has this picture. Gigafactory 3 Phase 1 enters the roof paving stage ahead of a May 2019 target. Look at this thing. It's crazy how much... Um, progress has been made on the gigafactory it's crazy so um elon was just clarifying again to some people that even though the factory itself could be enclosed by may it still will take a few months to you know install equipment validate it and start production and stuff so it's looking good maybe by the end of the year they can actually start producing cars like they're hoping i'm sure that's what their goal is and they have internals and we don't know exactly where they are but this is super impressive they don't fool around in china that's how they roll, baby. It's like you throw 10,000 people at the problem, you can solve stuff quick. It is crazy. Yeah. I can't believe how fast this is going. I'm sorry you guys can't see necessarily the picture, but um, those no, of you watching that, yeah. on YouTube and stuff, there is a great video. I'll link to it again. Uh, by the way, again, all of these articles that we talk about will be linked in the video in the podcast description. So if you want to follow along, uh, just go in there. We'll have all the links for this stuff. There's a great video that comes with it. I don't speak um, Chinese, unfortunately, so I can't see what they're what's going. But but there's a guy who's walking the grounds and he's talking to some of the locals, and uh, you know he has translations down at the bottom, and uh, they seem to be pretty impressed. So things are moving along on the Gigafactory three. I just wish they would do something with Gigafactory two and get that thing going too over in Buffalo. Anyways, that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> Uh, okay, last one here is uh, sustainable products and manufacturing. Eric, I want you to take point on this. Okay. So, uh, so yes, so, go ahead. Yeah, go so ahead. earlier this earlier uh, in the week and late last week, there was a report coming out, uh, the Tesla release of a 48-page, what they call an impact report. There was a blog post about this that came up on their site. Uh, after the story came out, I went ahead and tweeted about it. And uh, soon after that, the PDF was available for everyone to read. So if you hadn't had a chance to see it, you can actually go on to their um, tesla.com slash blog and look at the impact report uh, available there. Again, it's 48 pages, and this is a beautiful PDF. I mean, if it, I, I was I, just I, about to say it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Now, I'm not biased uh, in, in, this, <laughs> in this regard, uh, but when it comes to PDFs, I've seen some pretty bad PDFs, and this is oh, well yeah. laid out. Uh, so they essentially broke up the document to four different sections. Uh, the first section has Tesla discussing um, their product impact, uh, specifically as it relates to the environment, the energy grid, sustainable energy, uh, and talking about how they built the cars from the ground up to be the safest cars on the road. The report then goes into their operational impact. Now, this is really uh, the heaviest part of their document. Uh, it goes into uh, greenhouse gases, which we'll talk a little bit, uh, how it affects in Canada, energy efficiency, sustainable energy. Uh, they talk about the factories and, and essentially their profiles and, and how they work with their local grid. They get into superchargers, and then they actually get into some case studies regarding the Fremont factory and Gigafactory 1. Then the report goes into their supply chain uh, 
responsible sourcing, uh, how they get the minerals from the ground, cobalt, which we're seeing less and less of in batteries, which is kind of a good thing, um, and then how their suppliers have uh, also some consideration in terms of what they're supplying uh, for the product line. And then lastly, the report talks about the employees at Tesla all throughout the world and the culture of the company, uh, rewarding the individual, educating their staff members and local people in the community. Uh, so it's, it's a whole lot of stuff in there, um, complete with graphs, documentation, images, the works. So even if you're just someone who wants to kind of skim through it, I encourage you to do so. Because oftentimes we're, we get sort of lost in the shuffle what Tesla's mm-hmm. overall mission is. And that's sort of outset from this document. And it's, it's reinforced all throughout it. And ideally for me, who's an environmentalist, this is really a big deal. Uh, this is their first report. They intend on doing more of these in the future. I wish more companies would do that. So it's kind of more transparency in terms of how their uh, manufacturing and, and processes do impact the environment. Um, the one thing I'm interested in doing in the future with them is seeing how their delivery systems, um, both shipping products in through through vessels, uh, hauling it by trains, driving them through their cars, how that's also impacting it. But that's that's something we'll see later on, I'm sure. But uh, for now, it's a great report, and uh, we'll uh, pass it back to you. Excellent. Thank you for that report. Yes, very uh, valuable to read. And again, link will be down in the video description. Um, Public service announcement part two. Uh, Before we get to viewer listener questions, um, my good friends at uh, Jetta Wireless, and I mentioned this last week, they said that they were going to announce their upgrade program for the V2 uh, Jetta Wireless Pad. It was supposed to happen on the weekend. They sent me an email today. They tell me that it was going to launch tomorrow. So Ooh. that would be Thursday. So those of you who haven't seen it, this, by the way, is the new Jetta Wireless Pad version 2. It has three charging coils, so two of them for portrait mode and a third one here for landscape. It's got this new red finish here on the back with the little positioning dots and, the, you know, get your micro USB ports. It's thicker, so it doesn't warp. It's got the larger ledge, and it's got these two little holes. And the reason for that is because you can pass your charging cables through here um, or your regular lightning or USB 3 cables. If you don't want to use the wireless part, you can actually put one of the cables there so you can actually direct connect. So they tell me in the email, and I'm just going to kind of read it here. Uh, they said, we'll be providing a $25 discount for V1 customers, uh, and they will be including the free spacer valued at $20. This is the little spacer, by the way. And the reason for this spacer is because the pad is thicker, And if you want to use these charging cables, they've included this little uh, spacer. So you take the little plastic cover on the front of your charging um, um, tray in your Model 3, the the, the one with the little cover. You put the spacer in, and it gives you the little locking positions to put those cables in. And then you put your stock cover on there. So everything lines up. They're going to include that. It's a $20 value for total savings of $45. They say they will be sending out emails uh, with discount coupons for everybody who bought a V1 if they wish to upgrade. Um, full disclosure, they sent me one of these. This is probably the first one off the production line for me to review. I did an unboxing video of this uh, a couple of months ago. Check on my backlog of videos to look at that. Highly recommended. This thing is amazing. Uh, full disclosure, I do have a referral code. If you want to buy one of these things, they throw me a couple bucks. Uh, if you buy one of those, I'll put that thing, uh, link down in the video in the podcast description if you want to use that. So anyways, uh, kudos to those guys. They make a great product. Um, I do have a Nomad as well from the other company, and um, I like this one much nicer. It's it's They've made some really good improvements. Uh, these guys listen to customers, so there you go. A little uh, PSA for those of you. Look at that. Look how nice my phone fits on that. Just not great. Love it. Anyways, highly recommend it. If you guys don't have a wireless charger and you have a modern smartphone, this thing is the bomb. All right, we're going to take a little pause here and listen from our sponsor, and uh, we'll be right back with viewer, viewer listener uh, questions. Fine Lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels, effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do it yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla, we were meant for each other. 
Just before we get into viewer questions and answers, uh, I almost forgot, and shame on me for <laughs> for doing this, but late breaking news today, and I had a chance to participate, the uh, Canadian government has formally announced their uh, plans to help with climate change by um, instigating a zero emissions vehicles rebate program at the federal level. This has been in talks uh, in secret for some time. I was very fortunate today to go down to the electric vehicle discovery center run by the great folks at plug and drive. And I had to, um, and I was uh, able to meet uh, the honorable minister of uh, uh, science and economic <laughs> development. <laughs> development. Thank you, Mr. Navdeep Baines. Really nice guy. Uh, so the gist of it here is that starting on May 1st, the federal government um, will have an um, electric vehicle incentive program. Um, there are a few caveats. Now, everybody qualifies for, uh, for one. So this is not like a tax thing like they have in the U.S. It's a bona fide uh, rebate. But there are a few and somewhat concerning um, caveats in the program let's just say so anyway so they're basically the ba the base model manufacturer's suggested repri uh, retail price has to be um, less than forty five thousand dollars for a passenger vehicle with six or fewer seats and less than fifty five thousand dollars for vehicles with seven or more seats the eligible vehicles with uh, for eligible vehicles with six or fewer seats higher price versions trims in quotes are eligible as long as the manufacturer's su suggested retail price is fifty five thousand dollars or less. Canadians who purchase or lease an eligible va uh, battery electric hydrogen fuel cell wah, wah, or longer range plug in hybrid vehicle will will receive an incentive of five thousand dollars. Canadians who purchase or lease a shorter range plug in hybrid vehicle will receive an incentive of twenty five hundred dollars. Um, shorter range, and I haven't looked at the list here to see what the battery breakdown is. Um, Ian, is it on the? I know you have the list yeah. of vehicles that are eligible. Um, is there any indication on there as to what the cutoff is as far as the battery? I'm assuming this is a battery size thing. Did you see that on the list? Uh, yeah, but I don't have it in front of me. I just have the right now. What I'm looking at is the actual list of eligible vehicles, mm -hmm. and it's got to be somewhere under 10 kilowatts i assume uh, would be the cutoff yeah because even like the volt qualifies for the full rebate you know and that's got a, a 16 kilowatt battery 16 17 kilowatt battery something like that yeah so it's it would be relatively small batteries that would uh, that would not qualify and they'd get the uh, the 2500 instead of the 5000 so sadly based on what we're discussing here, which is all things Tesla, is Tesla is nowhere to be seen on this list of eligible vehicles because Tesla has no cars that are under $45,000 in Canadian dollars. Because of the exchange rate, uh, we are pushed almost to $50,000 base price on these cars. So um, needless to say, on Twitter and the Twitterverse and uh, Facebook and the forums, it's been exploding. Everybody's super upset about this because they are essentially ignoring the largest segment uh, player, if you will, that has any kind of volume vehicles uh, ready for delivery. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion as to how can we get this corrected. I know that um, Electromobility Canada, EMC, has been pushing hard behind the scenes during these negotiations to try and get the MSRP cap lifted because the initial amount was uh, $45,000. They were proposing $55,000. However, it looks like this $55,000 value was uh, used and twisted around to benefit what looks like to be the Chrysler Pacifica because that's the only car on there that looks like it can qualify for that particular amount. So sad um, that Tesla's not on there because they're, um, like I said, they're ignoring... Uh, a hugely popular vehicle. So I want your thoughts on this, guys, because I'm all out of ideas. Uh, well, you know, at first, it, it tends to read or sound like the sort of maliciousness that uh, the Ontario government, when Ford came in, you know, it's a chop, uh, the program, and specifically word the, the phase out in such a way that immediately penalized Tesla. I don't Correct. think that's what's going on here. Uh, I got the impression that they they wanted a good-looking program that covered a wide variety of vehicles, which this does. I mean, the majority of EVs currently available in Canada are on the list. However, uh, I don't think they wanted to commit the amount of money it would have cost them if you included Model 3, because Model 3 would be a huge number on top of what we're seeing here. 
you know, it would may, it maybe add, I'm spitballing a number here, but another 30, 40% to the sales if you added up what you have on this list and then tacked Model 3 onto it. So maybe it just wasn't in their budget to be able to come up with the amount of uh, incentive to, to cover all the, the base Model 3s. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's why, because that's a really funny number. Like, I mean, it seems to me yeah. 50,000 would have been a nice round number and you would have got Absolutely. the base car in there. Yeah. So for sure, someone did the calculation said, yep, you know, we can handle all the Leafs and the Volts and the uh, Fusion Energies and the Ionics and all the rest of them. But if you put Model 3 numbers in there, think, you know, our budget's going to go tilt. I don't have the list in front of me. Is the, Kira, uh, is the Kia Nero EV on that list? Yeah, it is. And I mean, you know, the, the, the widespread EV enthusiast in me is very happy to see that because that's a great vehicle. I mean, you know, you're talking um, the like 400 kilometers range for the Kona Electric and uh, that made the list. And then there's the Nero plug-in, which is another good one. Now, the Nero plug-in only gets 2,500 because it's got a relatively small battery. Correct. But, um, yeah, all, all of the other really good competitive choices are on there. But The reason I ask else. about that is because when I was at the car show in February, they, uh, they told me specifically that, at least initially, um, the only vehicle, the Nero, that they were going to bring in was the fully loaded one coming in around fifty-four, fifty-five $55,000 or something like that. And then today, when I was at Plug and Drive, uh, someone told me that they changed their mind because of this new... Um, they're going to uh, bring in a decontented version so yep. that they can fit under this. So, yeah, specifically for Nero EV, the SX Touring and EX qualify for the full. So, yeah, if you're going full electric Nero, uh, you qualify for the 5,000, and for the the plug-in version, you get 2,500 on both the SX and EX trims. My personal opinion here is that the base should have been 50 50,000. That would have covered. Probably even more cars, um, maybe even the i3, of course, which is a great car too. Mm. Um, it would have covered the Model 3, so. the base, standard range Model 3. I mean, the Delta is pretty close. It, even though, yes, the standard range Model 3 is off menu, the Delta is maybe, what is it, 2500 bucks or something like that? Yeah. So anyways, you know, I, and you know what? contact I, I Tesla. I mean, yeah. you know, can you help us out? I mean, we talked about this before where they had played this game in Germany and they got wrapped on the knuckles for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, I don't they, know. they could sell a super software limited version of the base Model 3 that had like 100 kilometer range, something absurd no, that everybody yeah, would want to unlock. And legitimately, that would fly. So, I mean, the car comes in at whatever, 44.9, and then you add your whatever, $3,000 software unlock to make it a you know, an SR or an SR plus. Um, one thing that I thought was fascinating, because the first thing that came to my mind to hack this is, okay, make the car 44.9 and it has a $3,000 transport fee. <laughs> Lo and behold, <laughs> it says, important note, um, all vehicles that appear on this list, da, 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 all fees and costs related to the purchase or lease of an eligible vehicle, such as freight charges and delivery charges, should be comparable to the same fees and costs for other vehicles sold by the same automaker. If Transport Canada assesses that an automaker is potentially deviating from the standard pricing approaches, these fees and costs, Transport Canada reserves the right to withdraw a vehicle from eligibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're covering their butts right now. That's called yeah. a COIA if I ever saw one. Yeah, so no yeah, doubt. So they're trying, yeah, they're trying to prevent any kind of shenanigans with this so it looks like they've covered most of their bases anyways yeah i'm sad to see uh, tesla not on this list i uh, you know i can see your point as to um you know this being potentially a a, um, a financial thing of course um you know there's a lot of discussions on the internet you know people look at it both ways they say oh if you can afford a tesla you don't need a rebate well i you know i'm sorry but i don't tie that necessarily to uh an economic class this is an incentive it's not a reward mm -hmm. um I yeah, don't for know. a lot of people, it's the difference between being able to get the car or not, you know? Well, it was for me, and that's one of the reasons I yeah. jumped in when I did. And I know lots of people are in the same boat. I still have a loan on my car. It's not like I paid cash for the damn thing. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, you know, if you still feel that it's an issue, take it up. But it looks like this is happening. I mean, it's coming in May 1st, and whether you like it or not, um, off we go with this. I mean, it's better than nothing. That's great. And yeah. the fact that it's not tied to taxes means that everybody qualifies. Yep. So my personal opinion, if you're going to cap it, always, you know, don't do an economic cap on terms of income. Uh, cap the price of the vehicle if you have to be, uh, if you have to, as long as it's reasonable. In this case, I think it's about $5,000 short of the reasonable amount. But that's, per yep. that's just personal amount, uh, personal opinion at this point. So. Hi, can, can the American chime in? Go, man. I, I guess. So. <laughs> so <laughs> 
So nice. when, I, when I read the, when I read this today, uh, you know, I, I knew this was coming out because Trev, you alerted uh, many of us. Uh, you let us know, then of course you let your uh, our dearest and closest friends on social media know that you're going to do the event. And um, I was I was the only one there with a camera, by the way. Huh. Hey, um, I'm, I'm surprised I let you in. So <laughs> <laughs> not that so, guy. Right. So, um, oh, we subscribed to your channel. Anyway, so the, the two two things sort of came to mind um, when I read the report later in the day. One is it's great that they're starting with something because the act of doing nothing to me is more treacherous than there is anything else. Like you have to start doing something. I and agree. if Canada, if its ultimate goal is to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, then this program is a step in that direction of saying, look, we are trying to do what we can to, to get that message out there. We're trying to get as many of these cars into the hands of as many drivers as possible. Now, we are a Tesla centric podcast totally understand my problem went beyond tesla because then i started thinking about rivian i started mm. thinking about jaguar all the other manufacturers i mean volkswagen has concept cars but that's just not going to count um but when you think of all the different manufacturers that are out there trying to get um as canada calls them zero emission vehicles to the market whether they're electric or hydrogen or whatever you're trying to get these cars in the market. The idea that you're still not incorporating the mass market only means you're still not taking what I think is the greatest challenge in our lifetime of climate change that seriously. Like, yes, you're doing something. That's like saying the house is on fire, get the hose. It, it has an effect, but it's not significant enough. Mm. And I think Canada, and, and I'm hoping there's a change. I'm hoping they increase the, the cap number. This was, um, I think, ideally, 60,000 might be even better. But 50,000 oh, yeah. is, is a great start if you're looking mm. for the standard range Model 3. Because in the programming, they say it's $45,000 MSRP for the base model. But, the, but any um, premium version of that car anything with a higher trim up to fifty five thousand could still qualify for some incentive so bump each of those numbers up by five thousand and now we're talking now now you're looking at other different trims of the model three and maybe the model y down the road so anyway it, it is it is disheartening at the same time uh promising but it's it's not enough and i'm the kind of person be aggressive with this really, really put out what is going to be a very advanced program because you're seeing across the pond in Europe the programs that countries like Norway are putting out there to really incentivize owners for having electric vehicles. And and we hear the numbers all the time like just exactly how many electric cars are on the road in Europe. We can have that here. The demand is there. There's no question about it. The demand is there. You mentioned it before. Canadians want to go across Canada from Vancouver to Montreal, be able to just charge the car along the way. It's You want to have that Trans-Canada pathway electrified. Well, the way you're going to do that is by getting as many cars in order as fast as you can. So in the U.S., I don't want to see the program we have now go away. I'm hoping we do. We talked about it in the show last week. We're hoping yeah. that there's some bill put forward that does get passed that we're able to have some incentive for American drivers as well. The only way we're going to change the way the grid is set up is by having an investment in renewable energy uh, solutions and in uh, renewable energy grids and by having electric cars in the road. That's it. Like, it's, the, it's the only thing we can do. Anything short of that is an embarrassment. And that's it. Cool. Um, word. Word, man. Um, true, I'm true going to that, one more piece of information I want to throw in here, and then I'm going to preempt what I think would be possible questions for the next show. Um, the government is proposing to invest $300 million over three years on a federal uh, purchase incentive. So it, it, it the program right now at this point is for three years. So who knows what's going to happen in the future. Now, 
to your question in in your um, discussion about this, when you mentioned the Model Y, and I know some people are going to ask this because the caveat in here is six seats or higher because the Model Y is going to be available with a seven seat variant. Model Y will not qualify because the base price of the Model Y is forty seven thousand dollars US. That translates to about sixty one thousand dollars Canadian. Mm. So that that car is out of the running as well. So if you're looking for a Model Y, thinking you're going to get a rebate, sorry, but that's just not going to happen. The other question that's surely going to come up is what about BC and Quebec because because they have uh, uh, provincial rebates. And uh, my understanding with this is that they can be stacked. So you'll not only get a federal rebate, but as long as the, prevent, the province still offers their rebates, you'll be able to stack those. So, you, so BC and, um, and Quebec, at least for the, um, for the time being, and then things could change in the future, if they deem that, well, the government's doing something, we don't need to anymore, we'll take it away. But for now, um, you can stack those rebates. So those two provinces are going to make out like bandits, I think. So it's still 8000 bucks in, in uh, Quebec, right? Yeah, and get this, if you're a resident of the city of Laval, they kick in yeah, another, another 2, 2 yeah. So you get 15000 right now. It's like people in Laval... You got to go now. <laughs> this is matter of, this is matter of fact, I just I, I just wait. had a message. I just had a friend from from my friend and uh, who lives in Granby, uh, which is an area I used to live in. He says I need to move to Laval. <laughs> Hell yeah, fifteen k. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of that part. Let's get into some viewer questions because we got a lot of good ones this week. Um, so the first one on the list here comes from Jerry. Thank you. Um, by the way, everybody who submits the questions, thank you very much. We put these out on Twitter. Um, no other medium because it's just easier for us to do this. So um, look for us to uh, usually post these questions on Twitter, usually Wednesdays or Thursdays, depending which day we end up doing the podcast. Today's a little bit early because, again, um, I have to go to Montreal tomorrow. So anyways... Uh, Jerry asks, should Tesla onboard computers be rebooted periodically just as we do with phones or laptops? Well, that's a really good question, Jerry. Um, I'm not in the habit of rebooting unless I absolutely need to. If I discover some kind of weirdness or something like that, hold down the both scroll wheels for a soft reboot. If you want a hard reboot, add the brake pedal. Make sure your car's in park, of course. Um, but no, not, not generally. Um, it, you guys don't reboot your computers on a regular basis other than no. you know, bug bugs. Same as you for bug. Yeah. The firmware lately, uh, I'm, I'm still getting a lot of reports, and I don't know exactly which firmware. It could be 8.3, anywhere from 8.3 to uh, 2019.12. Um, seems to be weird for a lot of people. Um, seem to be getting a lot more glitches than what we've normally seen. Uh, mine has been uh, quite rock solid, but then again, I attribute that to not using Sentry Mode or the dash cam on my car. But that's again, I talked about that last week. What mm -hmm. what, what do you want? Just the age of my car. Um, eight point five. Yeah, that's what I have. I find eight five rock solid. I have like okay. zero issues with it. If you're having issues with your car and you find that you're rebooting the computer too much, make an appointment with Tesla. Maybe they just need to reflash it or something like that. I know, you know, I get, you know, people asking me on Twitter all the time, oh, you know, is it normal? And I say, well, anything can happen. Mine is solid. Could just be the, you know, the staging or whatever it happens. So, again, I'll just say it. If you have issues, take it up with Tesla. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll gladly bend over for you. Yep. And, and help you out. Okay, uh, next question comes for Rajesh Paul. Uh, I won't say the last name, but Rajesh uh, basically says, I got my Model 3 this January. And notice that my range has fallen by 15 miles on a regular charge after a series of updates of Tesla. If the battery capacity drops considerably in the first year, does Tesla help it to replace? I'm assuming he's asking about the battery. Um, so the, the range um, with the updates that Tesla's been putting out is an estimate based on several factors, temperature, how you drive, your learning mechanisms, and so on and so forth. So it's not, it's not a, um, a set in stone amount. So if you see that your range is dropping, um, Tesla will look at your battery. They can do uh, diagnostics. So if you find that it's an issue, um, make an appointment with Tesla. But, you know, when they say whatever the, the latest update is, you know, what is it, 325 miles or something like that for the long range? Um, don't expect to get exactly 325. And, and don't forget, that's also 100% charge, which you really shouldn't be charging to. It's about 90% on a daily basis. Um, you guys want to add in anything on that? No. Right. I think you're correct, Trev. <laughs> I, I got to think it's, it's you know, it's the algorithm that predicts range based on your usage, especially, you know, this time of year. I don't know where this gentleman lives, but if it's in a cooler part uh, of the continent, Absolutely. then, yeah, that would explain a lot because it's, it's reflecting what's really going on. Uh, it should come back as things warm up. You know? Oh, absolutely. I've noticed it today. I mean, it was nice and warm out today, and uh, my watt hours per kilometers uh, drop precipitously. So, yep. um, yeah, exactly. and I'll know even more tomorrow when I go on a long-range trip. Okay. 
Next question comes from uh, Sander. I'm hoping I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, do you have any idea when the Model 3 lease option will come to Canada? Well, um, don't know. <laughs> I think... <sighs> How am I going to approach this one? Mm. <laughs> I'm really hoping in the next two months, because one of our VPs is on the edge on what he's going to buy next, and I so want him to get a three. Yeah. And But he's got a lease because it's a company vehicle. We we always tend to uh, trail what Tesla US does anywhere from weeks to months. Um, I think a lot of it just has to do with just getting regulations in place and financing and so on and so forth. Listen, if you're, if you're desperate, if, if you happen to live in Ontario and you're desperate for a lease on a Model 3, I can put you in touch with a private leasing company that can fix you up. So I don't know where you live. You're asking about Canada. I'm assuming you're Canadian. So, uh, yeah, if you're desperate for that and you don't want to wait any longer, then uh, get in touch with me. You know how to do that. Okay, next question comes from David, and it says, Hi, I live in Quebec, and I got my Model X last December during the never-ending winter that we had. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I know. Typical. Uh, my traffic-aware cruise control, and I have EAP, he says, stopped working many times due to, uh, due to snow. Is there any way to put regular cruise control, which means only keeping speed when this happens, because a two-hour drive without it isn't very pleasant. Even my old Acura 2016 provide a base cruise control, even with adaptive wasn't uh, possible. Thanks for the podcast. Thank you very much for the question, David. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to tackle this one. Um, I mentioned it even on the last podcast that my wife and I were down watch watching a movie and uh, it was raining and the uh, temperatures had dropped when we came home, whiteout conditions, and I lost autopilot, cruise control, like everything. I, I had nothing. So I'm in the same boat, absolutely. Um, even though that Tesla puts the radar behind the front fascia, if it wipes out the radar, you're SOL. You get nothing. And um, there's got to be some kind of way that we, we can get Tesla to fix this. I don't know if it requires a software update or they need to do some kind of hardware, but I'm with you on 100%. And I think you guys probably agree the same way. Ian, you would know in the winter? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to think this is not a big problem for Mr. Camacho, but uh, yeah, it drives me like nuts when it does that because, you know, it happened to me on the trip to Florida. I went for about three hours at one point through Pennsylvania where I couldn't get anything. I don't mind yeah. losing all the rest of it, but like I'm I'm exactly with David. It, it, please just give us back standard cruise. Like what is the hazard in that? I mean, if you don't if you don't order any autopilot or, or, or any of the options, I mean, that's what you get anyway, right? So the car is capable of it. Uh, I think we got to pester Elon on that one and, and get that as the backup mode. Yeah. Next time I see Elon uh, getting on a tweet storm, I'm going to see if I can get his attention on that because, yeah, I yeah. agree with you 100%. There's no reason to not lose that. Even if you lose traffic aware, just give me the speed maintain. I don't care. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see here. Next question comes from Kirk. He says, I'm desperate to join the early access program. How can I do it? <laughs> Are you sure you want to get into that based on all the bugs we've been seeing? <sighs> um Listen, I understand uh, that people want to get the latest software updates, but there are side effects of that too because you are getting to be on the bleeding edge of things and if there are show-stopping bugs. Uh, so you have to have a thick skin if you want to get into this program because the last thing you want to say is, uh, oh, I got the latest software, and then you get on uh, social media and you bitch about all the problems. you got to be able to take you know, some sticks with the stones with this stuff. So um, if you want to get into the early access program, uh, there's only two ways. You either have to be invited by Tesla or uh, you have to purchase, uh, you have, would have had to purchase FSD prior to um, all the shenanigans that happened. You had to be an early adopter. <laughs> we'll just say shenanigans for now. Uh, you had to be an early adopter. Um, now, there is also the priority software updates, but that is a referral award. That's mm -hmm. a different thing altogether. That you, you just get priority access to the latest firmware updates that have been right. vetted. And, and, but that's a different thing. He's asking about early access, which is the beta program. So, yeah, my understanding is that those are the only two ways. You have to be personally invited by Tesla, or, um, and that happens just random. Um, nobody asks for it. It just happens to show, uh, show up. I have a friend of mine who, who tweeted at me. He says, uh, privately, of course, and he said, hey, I got an invite. Should I? I said, well, that's up to you. He says it was no prodding on his part. It just got invited. Or, like I said, it is one of the concessions for people that early adopted FSD. You get into the early access program. So, Kirk, I hope that answers your question. You didn't give us any more specifics as far as that's concerned, but those are the two ways that I'm aware of. Okay, next question comes from Paul. It says, I live in the UK, and I'm looking at purchasing a Tesla in the next year, and you, S or X, is out of my price range. 
I want to make sure that I'll be able to handle camping trips. Two kids, large tents, lots of kit. I uh, currently just fit this in a Ford Focus with a roof box. I have a Model 3 reservation, but I'm worried about cargo capacity and loading via the hatchback. The Model Y looks ideal, but I don't want to wait two plus years. In the UK, we can't install non-manufacturer approved aftermarket options like tow bars without causing insurance issues. Oh, good to know. I didn't know that. So I'm thinking about a use S with the roof bar, uh, roof bar attachments would be the best. Which Model S versions can you install roof bars on, uh, or is it just the new ones with the old sunroof? So the answer to that is, um, well, it's two parts. Um, <laughs> that's a long-winded email but or, or question, but I had to read it out in full. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, you're absolutely right, Paul. I think the Model S is your best bet. If you're looking for one and you want official roof bars from Tesla, you have to buy the one with the roof, uh, the panoramic roof, because it's the only one that has the attachment points built into the car. You can buy uh, what are called sea suckers, which um, I have one over here, but I'm not about to go get it. Um, uh, to attach things like uh, bike racks, roof racks, and stuff. They work uh, exceptionally well. So even if you buy a Model S with uh, just the uh, metal roof or the glass roof, you can use that as well. There's uh, And they're quite secure. There's videos out there put out by the company where they take a car around a racetrack with a bike, and they don't go anywhere. Um, so those are viable as well. Probably, I think the price would probably be about the same thing as, as getting an official roof rack from Tesla. So, yeah, if you want to do camping and stuff, that's probably your best bet. The Model X would obviously be the best bet, either the 5 or the 7 seat, not the 6 seat, because those those seats don't fold down, of course, um, if you want to go camping. So, yeah, if you can't wait for a Model Y, those are your options. So, And there's probably some good deals coming off lease, of course, with the Model S. E? I, I'm going to descend. I'm going to descend. I You're going to descend? I'm going to descend, yes. That's not allowed. <laughs> Trevor's wrong. Shh, don't Ian's wrong. Me. No, okay, maybe Ian's wrong, but anyway, I, I still reserve the uh, the right to dissent. Um, based on the fact that he can get all his stuff I- into the um, into the uh, into the Focus, I cannot imagine that you couldn't put the same amount of gear into a Model Three between the frunk and the trunk. Well, um, there's a huge unless amount you of want to camp in, in the car. car. Sorry, unless you want to camp in the car. Yeah, well, I'm, I would still maintain the same thing, man. I've camped in my three. There's tons of room in there. I it's more. I'm sure it's more comfortable to sleep in, in, in the Focus. But he's carrying around a tent. I got to think that's the whole uh, the whole intention is to use the tent. Well, he but he but he, I mean, and the key to this is he has a roof box, so he's at least got some of his gear outside the car. Yeah. The Model Three, you know, a while back Tesla had, um, you know, we we know like where you can attach um, a roof rack on the three. We see where those those points are. Unless he can do that, I would say it's, you know, it's, it's a touch. And for what, so I agree with you, Ian, on that part, which is you don't need the size of the S for what the three is. However, if he's looking for a car sooner than later and he can get a, uh, a used model S for less then go, I would say go with the S just because it's a larger vehicle. Yeah. You're right. The, the economics work, but of course, you know, um, yeah. the the roof bars are available now for the three. I mean, I was just they are. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, so well, when they're in can, stock, when they're in stock, yes, exactly. <laughs> right. right. So you you could still add the roof box to the three. I mean, there's uh, that's the other option there. I this mean, is a, this is what the this is the same suction cup. I had to go over there and get it. By the way, this is the same suction cup. Uh, this is for camera mount, but it's the exact same uh, six inch uh, suction cup that the sea suckers use. They just unscrew this part. Super super skookum. That doesn't go anywhere. You pump it down. 14 pounds per square inch at sea level is enough to hold this stuff on forever. So, anyways, my recommendation. Okay, moving along here. Next question comes from uh, Jorge. He says, uh, when will the Tesla system be available in Portuguese? Ah, well, I can't speak to exactly which languages are going to be available, but that is one of the, well, multilingual support um, is in the 2019.12 release, the one that was kind of put out there and halted a little bit, um, I think uh, Raj, our good friend Raj uh, from the Tesla Raj um, uh, YouTube channel, had put out a video where he was navigating in Spanish. I know Portuguese is not Spanish. I don't know what language are actually included in there because I, I really don't know at this point. So I'm hoping that it comes out fairly soon. So if Tesla's adding that, at least in the navigation system, that it'll be uh, good for everybody. So I hope that answers your question. Keep our fingers crossed on that. L- hey, listen, if we find out for next week or whenever it comes out, uh, we'll be the first to let you know. Uh, Nathan asks, uh, when the car brakes uh, while in autopilot, is it using the regen braking or the actual brakes? I know the question, but you guys want to answer? Uh, both. 
Yes, de- depending exactly. on the severity of it. So it, yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, it mild deceleration, it would use the regen, but when it starts to tap out or in any kind of full blown emergency, mm-hmm. it's going to go for the hydraulic brakes. Yep, mm-hmm. and you can actually watch this happen if you if you watch the the energy meter on your screen, that little bar that goes right and left, depending on what you're using power. Yeah, you'll see it as it adjusts speed and slows down for traffic. It'll it'll go off to the left in the region uh, side of the column. Just to preempt, in case someone asks, because sometimes these things tie in, do the brakes come on when you have uh, when you use regen? And the answer is yes. Um, Tesla has an algorithm in there that actually simulates. Um, braking when the car does regen. There are certain deceleration cycles that they use and you know how fast you're going and stuff. So it, it literally acts just like if you were applied to brakes, if you just brake with regen. So if you let off an accelerator going fast, you know, all you have to do is watch your car. You'll see the brake lights come on. So I just wanted to answer that in case somebody was to pop up and say, well, what, what happens to the brakes? So, yeah, okay. brake lights do come on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, next question comes from Anthony. Uh, I know Anthony. Hey, Anthony, how you doing? Um, he says, any thoughts on the exclusion of Tesla from the Canadian federal rebate after the official? Well, this ties into exactly what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Yep. So go back a little bit. Um, and then Thanks, we'll, Anthony. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Anthony. We'll have more to talk about next time when I see you next week, buddy. All right. Um, the next question comes from uh, Deep. He says, what price do you think the Tesla pickup truck will be? Ooh, that's a really good question. I, I'm thinking Model X-like numbers. I agree. Yeah, that's, that's- sounds about right around there on the upper end just to reiterate some of the stuff that we know publicly about the tesla pickup truck that elon took to twitter last year and answered so he said that the car will have or the truck i should say will have an official towing capacity of three hundred thousand pounds we'll see seating for six people outlets for 240 volts um air suspension all-wheel drive big battery pack uh, this is not going to be cheap truck, folks. This is uh, this is not uh, bottom of the barrel F one fifty competitor. This thing is going to be balls out uh, a fancy car. I would suspect that. Um, I mean, let's face it, Rivian's out there. Uh, they've got their great um, activity trucks. They don't call them pickup trucks, but they got their activity truck and they've got their um, their SUV based on that one. Through the R one T, I think they call it, or the R one S, R one T, R one S. I got to keep them straight. Uh, great looking vehicles. I think they're going to do exceptionally well with those with those cars. Um, Elon said that their pickup is going to be very Blade Runner. So he says, um, I don't care what people think of it. We're just going to do it. Um, as far as how that translates into price, um, yeah, I don't think this is going to be cheap. <laughs> not initially, anyway. No, not initially, anyways. Uh, but looking forward to it. So um, if they follow through with what they said, and they will announce it sometime this year. I'm sure they're going to have another reveal event. I'm hoping to go to that. So. Use our referrals codes, folks. <laughs> Please. All right. Yes, exactly. All right, moving on here. Uh, Steven uh, sent us a question. He says, I have a Model 3, and I find it better in the back seat than the Model S, uh, just better designed. I have tried the back of an X, but at 6 foot 2 inches, I find even the middle row very cramped. For those that rode in a Model Y, can you compare that second row space to the Model 3 and the X? That's a really good question. Um, I, I had the opportunity to ride in the Model X at the reveal, or the Model Y, sorry, at the... Um, is he asking about the Model Y? Yeah, Model yeah. Y. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I sat in the front seat. I should have sat in the second seat, the second row. That was dumb on my part, but hey, it is what it is. Um, so my friend, um, James Locke. James, if you're watching, hello. He was sitting in the back seat. Oh, Kim Paquette as well. Hello, Kim. She, uh, Both of those uh, people were sitting in the back seat of the Model Y when we did our test ride. Uh, James is six foot one. He said he had plenty of headroom in the car. So I don't think it's going to be an issue uh, six foot two. Um, the Model Y does, uh, the seats are almost just like the Model 3, except, uh, well, at least the front row, the seats are just like the Model 3, but they're on risers, so it raises the seat a little bit. Um, the rear seats of the Model Y were, were interesting because they wouldn't let anybody touch the seats. Uh, they're on rails, they do move uh, forward and back, and of course they do collapse three ways because um, they put essentially a middle row that goes down so you can put ski, skis or surfboards or whatever the heck you want through the car. Um, I don't think six foot two is going to be an issue with this car at all. Um, as far as the second row space on the Model X and you think it's tight, mm, I, I find that hard to believe. I mean, the Model X is sculpted because the Falcon window comes down, you've got that glass, and there's an opening in there. Third row, I, I would understand. That's tight for sure. But the second row, hmm, I don't know about that. I think you'll be okay. I think you'll be okay. 
Okay, last question of the evening before we get to uh, closing comments and thoughts here. It comes from Lester. He says, when will the new T Tesla CCS adapter be available for purchase? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I know that the uh, the guys at Electric got an early look at the CCS adapter in Europe. There is still no official availability on that. They did say that uh, it will be provided for S and X owners, not not for free. You'll have to buy one. I have no idea on the price. I would expect that the price will be certainly cheaper than the Chatamo adapter that I have on my car that I never use, but whatever. It just makes more sense. I think all indications seems to be that Tesla is moving towards CCS um, at least short term to have both um but i think ccs is really the future as far as um as far as charging ports are concerned chatamo is more of a japanese thing early adopter thing but it's it's falling by the wayside i would hope that it becomes available in north america it just makes sense just to give you more flexibility largely on account we still haven't seen the chatamo adapter on the model 3 yet like what's the hole up tesla what's going yeah. on yeah what is up with that I don't know what's going on. Like, I Ian, I mean, you come back. You guys got a lot of uh, level three chargers. We're they're all dual. Swimming in Chadmo out here, the, but that. they're all dual. But they're all dual connector, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, you not? can. Yeah, you can. You can run either. They've they've got. All yeah, right, so yeah. just give us the CCS adapter and call it a day for crying out loud. I would pick one. You know, just do it. A couple hundred bucks. Who cares? Just yeah. do it. Yeah, I'd buy. So it. I, I hope it happens. Um, my money's on CCS at this point, based on the Chadmo just still not being available. Just makes more sense as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that's it for questions. Thank you, everybody, for submitting those things. Um, any closing comments, guys, or um, are we going to call it a night? Well, I do want to say that um, there are a lot of people who are new owners or new to the show. Thank you so much for doing your part to uh, make our planet greener, uh, make it healthier, uh, and for supporting our show. Um, I have some personal friends who are out there who just got their cars in the last few weeks, so it's exciting for them. Uh, to now be part of it. And I've gotten texts and tweets from them saying this is the greatest car they've ever had. Um, that's what and that's and, and that's the beauty of an electric car. I mean, I, we obviously we're a Tesla centric production. Um, but I think if you get an electric car and you see the difference of how the cars perform, I, I you can't go back uh, to anything else. And um, next week uh, will be my one year anniversary of owning my car. So when we do our show next, when we do our show next week, we'll be celebrating. Um, but yeah, next next year, next week marks one year that I've had my Model Three, and um, yeah, this this is a momentous time for us. I think in terms of our podcast, in terms of the Tesla community. So if you're contributing to the uh, the forums, if you're talking to other owners, if you're like our friend Rafael uh, Santoni, and you're you're just talking to people at random who are curious about Teslas or electric cars, anything you do to spread the word to help get the message out there and to put people in these cars, you're all doing your part. Uh, the show is a uh, a ripple in the sea of, of electric vehicles, and uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of our supporters. So thank you so very much to our sponsors, to our Patreon supporters, to our listeners, to our tweeters, to the questions you guys give us. Um, we keep doing the show because we know you crave this energy and this, uh, this, and this information. So uh, thank you very much from all of us to you. Awesome, Eric. And on that note, where can people find you if they want to have a chat with you? You guys can find me on Twitter at ECFix. That is E C F I X. There is a chance by the time you listen to the show in a few weeks, I might have changed my handle, but for now, you can find me there. Good to know. Ian, where can people uh, have a chat with you, and what do you want to plug? Uh, my handle on Twitter is Ian Pavelko, the full name. Um, Matt Hungarian is the nickname in front of it. And on the forum, uh, the Tesla Owners Online Forum, you can find me at Mad Hungarian. Um, PM me or just call me out if you want me to chime in on anything in wheels and tires or something remotely obscure and technical. I'd be glad to help. And uh, <laughs> If you are so inclined, I have a line of T-shirts that I use as a fundraising project for various EV organizations. Um, the um, site is uh, www.teespring.com, and just look up Mad Hungarian Evolve Wear once you get into Teespring, T-E-E -E Spring, and you can find my shirts. Excellent. Uh, links will be in the video in the podcast description if you want to check that out. Uh, little plugs for me, of course. We do have our merch. It's back. So if you want to look at that, you can find that on the uh, Model, th or Model 3. Models. <laughs> Man, I still got to get used to that. Uh, Tesla owners online. Um, I'll put a link in the video description. 
some good news too. I almost forgot. We finally got our stuff sorted out with TuneIn. So the podcast is finally showing up in the cars Yay. properly. I had to do a little bit of magic behind the scenes of changing the RSS feed and who the aggregator is, but it's finally working now. So we finally got that stuff sorted out. So thank you for cooperation with, uh, with TuneIn to get those finally in your Tesla. And as usual, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is Model3Owners. And uh, don't forget to check out the forum at uh, Tesla Owners Online. And uh, we will see you next time. Thanks for our sponsors, Dualaband Insurance, Evanex, and the great guys at Fine Lab Ceramic Coatings. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching and listening. We're happy to be back. See you later, guys. Happy Bye -bye. Easter weekend.